Good evening. <laughs> Thanks for joining me tonight. My name is Judy Spelberstadt, and I'm here tonight in Barb Ross's studio. Uh, I'm temporarily out of the studio, um, uh, and so Barb graciously invited me to uh, join her in her studio. So we are social distancing, uh, so it's all good. Um, but I want to thank Barrington's White House um, for inviting me to be a part of their virtual arts and culture series. And what we want to do is be able to still continue to bring the arts into your homes uh, versus being able to go in person and visit Barrington's White House. Beautiful venue, and they have tons of offerings all year long. So again, thank you to Barrington's White House for inviting me to share my work with you and my process and inspiration. So, I um, want to talk about my inspiration, where uh, the ideas come from and where um, all of this starts for me. Uh, so I am an outdoor person. Um, our family loves to go fly fishing. Uh, I used to ride horses and had horses at home for over 20 years. Um, so those are things that I naturally gravitate towards, are things out in nature or uh, horses. Um, I love to see uh, situations where people are interacting uh, with one another or with their animals or uh, things like that. So I'm always on the lookout. Uh, the main thing, too, once I see something is I'm attracted to what's happening in the scene with the light. And it can be something super dramatic uh, with shadows, uh, striking shadows, or um, just something is illuminated, uh, or something's happening with shadows on a person or the animal. So um, from there, uh, then I start to generate ideas and uh, decide how I'm how are you going to translate that on a, a two-dimensional surface? The one thing I, I want to make sure you understand, too, is that I'm not always or exclusively attracted just to striking contrast in value, light and dark. Sometimes the effect, the really sublime, subtle effect of a hazy, foggy day uh, that just sort of puts a veil over the scene is very intriguing to me too. So uh, uh, particularly when you go out plein air painting, you don't always get to choose uh, the lighting that's gonna happen that day. So I can be just as excited about uh, that foggy, hazy day as well. So plein air painting is where you go out in the field and you bring all your gear and you work under the natural conditions. And uh, this is my plein air setup uh, that I brought with and set up in the studio, in our studio, so you can see. I have an easel here. Uh, this happens to be a Heilman easel that, uh, and this is a Heilman pastel box. It has two holes right here that, um, there's different ways you can configure, you can configure your, uh, your setup. Uh, I choose to have my box low and like to have a distance between my box and my easel. So I take the Heilman uh, easel and attach it to um, the ball head on the, uh, this is a, a camera tripod, tripod. And it has a ball head and there's an attachment. So I, I put this up here. Um, I put this little uh, newspaper trough right here um, I don't use this outdoors, but in a studio to catch the pastel that might come off. Um, and then I could just fold this up and throw it out, but contain the pastel dust. So um, I have a thing called an easel butler that attaches to the tripod. And uh, I set my pastel box on it, bungee it to the tripod, because when you're out in the environment, if you have a windy day, uh, you don't want your, your setup to blow over. Also, um, this was a great garage sale find. It's a tubular aluminum uh, camping stool, and it weighs, you know, nothing. So I can throw it over my shoulder and bring that out there. If I have extra materials uh, or um, a portfolio that I want to carry home my boards uh, in under glassine, I can set this up next to my gear and it wasn't a big deal to bring it in because it was um, so lightweight. 
The next thing I want to do is talk to you about my favorite medium at this point, pastel. Um, let me share with you a little bit about the history of it and what it's made of. And unlike uh, what some people think, it is not, um, some people call it chalk. They think it's chalk. And when I think of chalk, I think of the chalk that people are using today in most beautiful ways on their driveways, sidewalks, um, giving us all these encouraging messages um, for us to read during this COVID-19 time. Uh, that is sidewalk chalk. And that is made differently than the pastels that I use in my process. Uh, pastel is pure pigment, uh, similar to or the same as uh, what's in oil paint. Uh, oil paints have oil mixed with the pigment and you've got a liquid uh, a medium and with pastel it's a, a dry binder and the, that is mixed with the dry pigment. So you have some of the same names as you would have on um, uh, oil paints, you know, cad yellow, cad red, and, and, and so forth. Um, but this is a dry uh, medium. Um, so it's very, you can have intense, you can have light, the lighter the color, um, the more white uh, that is put into it. The history of pastel is interesting because it goes back to the, um, there's, there's record of it going back to the uh, 16th century. Um, and also in doing some research, um, there is a record of um, Da Vinci and Michelangelo using pastels in preparatory uh, studies. At the time, there was only black, red, and white. Uh, so now we have probably upwards 1,600 different colors um, available to us artists. Uh, so unlike painting, where you take a few colors and put them on your palette, your board, and mix it on the board, we have this vast array of colors um, that you can layer and have the different layers show through. So in my work, I don't blend when I apply the color to the, to the board or the paper. I'll layer and scumble over it. Scumbling means to hold your, your uh, pastel and lightly uh, sort of glaze over it so you can see the bottom layers showing through. Uh, again, I am in a temporary situation with my, my own uh, studio, so today I just brought some of my pastel boxes that I take out in the field. So I have a lot more than this in my studio when it's all set up. I have a six foot long table and I have boxes of different types, brands, and um, uh, of pastels. We also have pastel pencils um, that are pastel, you know, inside the wood. And so I use a lot of these for um, sometimes detail work, but I use them a lot when I do my initial drawing on my surface. Um, I like to use bright colors. Um, so typically I'll use hot pink or a really bright blue. Um, and uh, so there are different types of pastels. There are hard pastels, which have a lot more binder in them, and they're sticks. Uh, these are sticks. Um, these are great to use, or, or the time when I use these is in my first layer. Because in pastel painting, you work from the hardest pastels are on your first layers, and then you work up to your softest pastels. Um, so these being the hardest, you know, I can run them over the, uh, the surface. I, it doesn't use up a ton of the um, pastel to do that because usually you're covering large areas with the uh, hard pastels. They're good for drawing. You can uh, take a, a razor blade and, and sharpen them down to a point. So you can also use these for detail work as well. Then um, we work up to uh, kind of a medium uh, hardness. 
And uh, a brand that I like to use are called Giro. Um, they're, this is about a half stick. So they're not super hard and they're not really soft. And they come in amazing colors. These are made in France um, for a couple hundred years. Um, I always make sure I have those in my plein air box too. Um, and then we work up to some, another brand called Unison. Uh, these are made in England. They're a little bit harder. And we have um, Sennelier. Those are super, super soft. And a, a favorite uh, made in Colorado is uh, Terry Ludwig pastels. These things are amazing. They come in cubes and you have these beautiful edges so you can do some cool mark making and uh, for landscapes you want to get things in the background trees lines you know you can use these on their side oh this is really fun um, one more thing i don't know if in the light you can see these these are iridescent pastels made by sennelier this is so fun to use i use it sparingly but on water for example uh, in my paintings, I'll use these blues, and under the right lighting, they glitter and glimmer. So I don't know if you can see that in here, but that's a really fun uh, thing to add at the end. Now, you keep uh, the pastels in order of color. Can you explain how you, why you do that? Oh, great question. Um, so I group them by color, uh, color family. So you have different, and if you notice, in both of these boxes, I have them set up light to dark. Light to dark. So you see a gradation of the color and the different uh, combinations, uh, mixtures, but the predominant color is, uh, is there in a different value. So this is the same same color, this is the light value, this is the dark value, because uh, this is more pigment, this has uh, white added to it. And I like to keep it organized. Uh, this isn't my idea, this is just a, a practice that uh, I've learned in, in the classes that I've taken um, and learning about the medium. So I, I like to set my up um, and set my place, my box on my easel or next to me with the lightest at the top and the darkest closest to me. Judy, um, why, yes. why, I know you've done a watercolor and oil paints. Why did you ultimately choose pastel to work with? Why do you like them so much? Great question. I love the fact that you could pick up a stick and just make a mark and see what happens. I don't have to spend a lot of time, uh, for me, uh, on a um, palette uh, with a wet medium and just trying to mix the color that I want. Uh, I know a lot of, some oil painters or acrylic, uh, they pre-mix a palette so that they can you know, apply it directly. I just love that I can go to my box, pick up a stick, put down a, uh, you know, a mark with it, and then react to that mark. So the first choice isn't always the right choice, but then I have something to work off of. So I love the immediacy. I love that it also is easy to clean up. I don't have to clean brushes. Uh, I don't have to um, um, you know, clean off the palette. It can become a lengthy uh, process. Um, there's no odor involved in it. I think the biggest thing when you work in pastel is you have to mind the dust. You need to have a con containment system as much as you can. Uh, but I love the immediacy, the vibrancy. Um, yeah. And I like the ability to layer uh, that you're able to, like I explained before, you can put colors on top of each other. Uh, you'll see in, when I get to my process uh, with my underpaintings, you know, sometimes I'll use complementary colors underneath so that um, things will really pop off the, the paper, the surface. The next thing that I want to talk about is how I select the subject or the scene. 
Um, so let's say I'm going out fly fishing, and, and as is the case more and more, I say, I'm going to fish for half the day, and I'm going to paint for the other half. So I'll bring my gear out, and you got this big, wide open space. How do you narrow that down? Well, got a couple of tools here. Um, one is this amazing viewfinder. Uh, now, people make their own viewfinders sometimes, but um, Dick Lick had this handy plastic thing. Um, that you can slide up and down. Uh, it also has the dimensions of um, painting written on the side. So for example, if I have a 9 by 12 surface on my um, plein air easel, which is typically 8 by 10 or 9 by 12 that I work in outside, I can you know, close this up to those configurations, and then I look through this. So it's kind of like the viewfinder on your camera, same thing. You could do this, except this, you can look at the exact dimensions of the surface you're going to use. Um, so obviously if I'm working in a larger size or my vision is to work up to a larger size, you want to make sure the ratio is the same on this as my large um, surface that I'm going to work on. But anyway, um, so basically you just look around and frame what it is that caught my eye. In the process of deciding what I'm going to paint, I need to scan what I, you know, the outdoors and find something that catches my attention and kind of absorb that and see what is it about that thing or that scene, and it could be, um, it could be the way the water's flowing over these rocks on the stream. It could be a distant hill with a barn on it that has a cool thing happening in the field with uh, tractor marks going up to the barn. Um, so it could be this big scene, or it could be something small that I want to zoom in on. And then I take my viewfinder out. Sometimes I stop right then when I choose this spot and I'll jot a few notes in my schedule and just say, love the light, love the rocks, love the color, blah, blah, blah. And then I go back and I look at and frame it in, in my viewfinder. Sometimes it happens on the camera, on my iPhone. Um, and then I decide, am I going to do it horizontal? Am I going to do it vertical? And then... Um, usually I try to take a picture of it right away because if I like those lighting situations, the light changes very rapidly outdoors. So you, you have to learn how to work fast. I'm not a real fast worker, so um, a lot of my paintings do not get completed uh, outdoors. But I want to gather as much information as I can. Uh, one of the things I love about working outdoors is that a photo doesn't reproduce the light effects accurately. So uh, inevitably, even if I don't like what I've done um, when I've been outside, I'll, I won't even look at it for a day or two, and then go look at it, and there's always something different than is what than what happened in the studio. So including all of the sensory experience while you're outside. Uh, you remember the sound of the water going over the rocks, the frogs doing their thing, the birds chirping, the cows, um, whatever, the mooing, off in the field on the farm next door. Uh, you bring all that, I, or I bring all that with me into the studio, those great memories. So we talked about pastel, um, what the medium is, and the different kinds of pastel, I want to share with you uh, different surfaces. So there are papers made specifically for pastel. Um, this one has a uh, sanded surface on it. It comes in many different sizes. I use um, uh, UART a lot. And on this box, you can see, well, this is 12 by 18 size, but there's all these different grades of uh, coarseness on the paper. Um, typically I use a 400 grit on there. Um, 
And if it doesn't, what's on this little easel here, it's on a, a board, which is like an archival map board. All of these um, surfaces are acid-free that I use, and um, it's good to have a, a rigid surface uh, behind the paper. You've got to have it. So if I use just a piece of paper uh, like this, I will get a hard surface of board and tape it. And typically, I like to tape with a black artist tape and go around the edges. And then I use it that way. However, there are also boards that are made for pastel. It's called pastel board. It's uh, hard, and it's got a grit a surface already built into it. Um, the texture, each of these surfaces are, are a little different to work with. There's nuance with each of them. Uh, but uh, here you've got your, it's easy to frame when it's on a board like this. Um, this happens to be a gesso board. And sometimes I'll take a, just a gesso board that's made for um, oil or acrylic painters. And I'll take uh, a, a clear gesso and tint it with some acrylic paint. And depending on the intensity of what I want to have underneath my painting, it could either be um, bold or it could be more um, muted. But I mix those things, uh, the, the paint, the clear gesso, and the pumice, which is, adds the grit to that, um, that little recipe there. And I paint it on the board with a brush like a, a you know, one inch wide brush, and I want the brush marks to show. Uh, particularly if I'm in, doing a landscape and I want to have some texture in my scene, um, it has a real painterly effect as well, because you see brush strokes underneath. Thank you. you have an example of that in the front there. Yes, so I have um, an example of it on this. This is a start from a plein air painting. I use this hot pink tint in the clear gesso and pumice, and you can see these brush marks. Um, it also, I can apply a lot of uh, pastel to this, because it's, it's a lot of grit. The more grit there is, the more layers of pastel you can apply. So, the next step in my process is um, I've determined, let me summarize a little bit, so I've chosen my scene, my subject, I've chosen the size that I'm going to work on, and I've taken some reference photos for future reference, uh, either back in the studio or, um, well, back in the studio either way, because uh, I don't use the photos at all, obviously, when I'm outdoors. Uh, the next thing I do is I can take this little viewfinder again, put it down to the size of the surface that I'm going to be painting on, and make some squares in my sketchbook. I brought several different sketchbooks along to just give you an idea. I love sketchbooks. Um, so many people I know and admire have amazing sketchbooks that in and of themselves are little works of art. So what I'm trying to do in the, in the sketchbook is to, um, to work out in my mind what it is I'm trying to say about the scene. And what you see here so far in the black and white is what we call value as a painter. So I, I know a lot of people watching are painters, but there are people who aren't painters. So a value, here's a value scale starting at white all the way down to black, and then these increments between. So in a painting, um, I want to work out what the value pattern is it doesn't have to do with the, the individual items, but it has to do with the value pattern. Sometimes it is a major shape that is a thing, but other times it's a grouping of shapes that make the, the, the value shape. So one thing we don't want to do in the creation of um, a work of art, or what I prefer, um, is uh, the, the, the concept of having a dominant value shape uh, and then have the other two values. So you use like three to four values in your, 
in your painting. So, um, and they should be an uneven distribution. There should be a dominant one, but you shouldn't have three equal uh, distributions of the values. So this just gives you an idea of all the different kinds of sketching that I do. Uh, uh, I've learned all of this through taking workshops with a lot of uh, amazing artists around the country that I um, respect and really love their work. So um, this is a technique. The other use for my, my uh, sketchbook is to go out in the field and I have these really great little mini watercolor setups. Um, let's check out this little brush. This is so fun. This little teeny weeny little thing. And I have, um, you can buy these little tubes that you can put water in and they have a brush tip on it and it's under two ounces. So you can even carry it on the plane. And if you want to do little sketches on your long flight somewhere, you can get out your pen, your Sharpie pen, uh, I did this on site in a trip on a trip I uh, was at, um, but yeah, all these things. This was up in Canada. Um, this was down in the city uh, doing a, a, a workshop with Kathy Newman. Um, but you can carry this anywhere, and you can use it anywhere. You've got your water, a little brush, and this, and your pen, and you're set to go. So anyway, sometimes my work outside is just. Um, grabbing some information in a little watercolor sketch, or eventually, I'm gonna do those little thumbnails, these black and whites. This is creating the roadmap for what I wanna do in the, in, when I take it to the next step and work at the easel. And then, um, I will um, draw, oh, prepare my surface. So, I like to do underpainting. Some, I don't do it all the time. But I'll take my surface, and I'm just going to show a couple examples of what I do. Um, I'll either take a new pastel, which is one of these, or a Krita color, uh, a hard stick, and um, just I translate what my scene is and draw it on my paper. Uh, this doesn't have an underpainting, but I'll take my pastel pencil and I'll draw out what it is. Uh, if it's the trees, if it's the mountains, if it's the barn, if it's the fly fisherman, I'll draw it on there and, and then I'm going to look at my value shapes. And I'll take this pastel stick, work on its side, and, and I'll have this stick in three different values if I want to have just um, the same color underpainting. I can just, you know, make the different shapes and I have my darker color here, maybe that's the trees, and then this is uh, the grass or something, and I, I fill that in, and then I take, um, if I use this technique, I'll take um, some odorless mineral spirits, and then brush it over the dry pastel, and it dissolves. And sometimes I like drips like this. This was high flow acrylic. I'll talk about that in a sec. Or uh, I like it to stay put. Uh, particularly, I, I don't know, sometimes I just want it to stay put. Sometimes I like it to uh, cross the borders and soften an edge between things. And say, for example, if you had a sky and you wanted it to go into your trees, on the underpainting, put more over those mineral spirits, let it drip down, and now you just soften this edge. And letting it drip too, and letting it go into other things, it's, it's uh, there's, a, there's a couple of, of principles where you work from your hardest pastel to your softest pastel. You'll work with your softest edges so you get to the end and then you start uh, getting your harder edges in. Um, there's an expression where they say it's like you, you work with a broom down to a toothbrush. 
that the right expression for, <laughs> for right. oil painters or acrylics? So in other words, in that medium, you, you work with a larger brush down to the smaller brushes. So in the beginning, we want to just um, get the general idea of where shapes are. So this is the new pastel that's been dissolved. Um, one of the things I like about odorless mineral spirits is that it, it dries fast, uh, particularly if you have some kind of alcohol base. Um, back in the day, it's kind of funny, uh, <laughs> a friend or a teacher gave us all, this is Kat Noon, uh, she gave us all little hand sanitizer bottles. This is like five years ago before there was a run on hand sanitizer. And we take hand sanitizer and spray it over our pastel because it was alcohol, it was compact, and it would dissolve fast. So that's kind of interesting um, that back then we, we kind of had uh, another use for hand sanitizer. So anyway, then sometimes I'll use watercolor. Uh, there's these really bright um, watercolors I'll put in a pan. Uh, if you look over here, I have... This is the, uh, the pan that I use to uh, put some, a little bit of this in here, get my water, put it on, and then uh, use it on my surface. Another thing that I really like to use as an underpainting is um, high flow uh, acrylic paint uh, made by Golden. So I'll, I'll put that in my pan too and dilute it as much as I want. Uh, this last one is also, this is uh, diluted oil paint. So I'll use uh, odorless mineral spirits on that. Or I will have uh, gouache, which is like an opaque, kind of like an opaque watercolor. Meaning, opaque meaning, watercolor is very transparent, and this you can't really see through. So I just want to show you a little bit. If I take um, pastels and just give you an idea of glazing over it with the pastel, um, how you can see through and see the, the color underneath. So it just is exciting to me to see how different colors react with different underpainting. I wanted you to just see a little bit of the effect of what happens when you put colors on top of each other and uh, how they sort of respond to each other. Oh, and that's what happens when you drop one. They break. So try to be careful with that. So we'll talk about uh, a particular painting, um, how I got started on this one. Uh, I chose to work on a surface. I had a, a few pieces of Wallace paper still um, that's no longer being made, but uh, it's toned a really nice medium value and it's warm. So I decided based on what I drew in my sketchbook uh, that how I was going to uh, play with this. So I have some photo references that I used. Um, we were getting ready to go fly fishing and we're up at early in the morning and the cowboys went out to bring in their herd and they were turned out all night with the deer and the animals playing. So um, anyway, I was standing there in the road. I didn't know they were bringing uh, the horses in and next thing I know I see the lead cowboy coming in and what I loved is the way these trees like arched over the trail where they came running in. And I just stood there and I just started snapping pictures. So here comes the cowboy, here come the horses. So the cowboys already passed. Um, and then these guys come and I'm snapping away. Oh, here we go. Here's the uh, picture. I don't know, Connor, if you can zoom in close enough on that. You see the lead cowboy bringing them in and they're in the distance coming through this beautiful archway of trees. And then we got the horses running in, and there's a second uh, photo of horses. And then the, the guy bringing up the rear with the herding dog, Dan and Pixie. 
and I love this picture. I love both of these pictures. I love the, um, and I love this picture. This is actually um, a combination of horses from two different photos. So uh, a lot of times I'll do that. I don't take great photos, but I get enough information. And sometimes I'll take pieces or elements of one photo and merge it in my dinosaur way in my sketchbook. And uh, anyway, but I love this picture of the lead cowboy uh, coming in. I love the curve of this trail. I love the marks from the tractors in the foreground here. So I'm going to do this. I chose the middle photo to start with, but I want to do a series of three paintings with these horses. So this is what's exciting to me about creating, is that you see something happening before you and it starts sparking ideas. And so I'm already thinking of the next painting. I gotta work on this some more, but this will be the next one. I'm really excited about that. We'll go back to the beginning. So uh, I took that information along with, um, let's see. Oh yeah, I have the second photo uh, taken with a different group of horses. So that one had some gray horses in it. And this one uh, just had the uh, uh, chestnut and bay, uh, brown, brown and, uh, what would you call that? It's called chestnut. Chestnut, I like, yeah. I feel like a redhead. Okay. Um, so anyway, we combined those. So I started over here on my paper, and I used my pastel pencils. Uh, when I, I usually start with one color, and as I make changes, I change the color of my um, pastel pencils so I know what the latest iteration or edit is on my drawing. And um, so after I did that, um, on this one, as I mentioned, I'm not doing um, an underpainting. Well, what I wound up doing is taking my pastel, I wanted to get this in right away, and, um, or I'll take that back, I actually wanted to get the trees in first. So I use the side of my pastel, and I can, um, I'll just uh, kind of show you. You know, then I'm just making big marks here. And you can see that some of the board or the surface is showing through. But I decide what colors, and I layered a few colors. I got a purple and a light green, and then I wanted to get the indication of the branches right away, get the horses going, and if you squint, uh, one of the other things I learned in classes that I take, you squint to see the values, the dark and light shades, and you open your eyes to see the color. So when you squint, you see, you know, where the darkest darks are and all of that. Um, so this is another progression shot where I just got some of these tractor marks in there. And I was using, again, these two photos. So... Um, and then this is a progress shot of where you can still see some of these lines. So as I was working on this, in my mind, I was liking the way some of these lines were showing up. So while I'm working on this, I was just kind of thinking, um, I think I remember that. I like that the line shows up. There's an artist, a French artist that, that I like, and I think it's Odilon Radin. And one of the things I love about his work is you see the line work. Um, another artist is Dawn Emerson, and I've taken a workshop with her, and I love the line work. But as I was working on this, I, I just said to myself, I like the line. So this is a little further along in the process. It's not finished. Uh, I've got this nifty uh, thing right here that I can hang the reference photo right on my easel. And I also use this setup. I believe this is, this is a, for musicians to put their iPad with their music in it. Uh, next up, um, got this tip from a friend in a class. And uh, we decided, oh, let's get these and put our iPads on it. So then you can queue up your your image on your iPad if you don't work from photo references. So 
this is uh, where I'm at now. Uh, still has more work to do, but notice there are a couple lines in here. So when I saw that and I liked that, all of a sudden I thought, wait a minute, I'm going to put a pause on this and I'm going to explore this idea. And then I thought back to a workshop I took with Don Emerson um, several, several years ago. She came to Lake Zurich to uh, Main Street Art Center and I didn't have to go far from home and she's from, uh, I think, the Seattle area. So anyway, I thought, you know what? I'm going to play with a horse. So I picked a horse, and it was this one, out of the middle, and I came over here, and I'll show you, I'll show you these. So like I said, this is the fun thing about creating. While you're in the process, something else strikes your fancy. You can put a pause and try something else. So I took a bigger piece of paper. I'm going to show you the real painting in a few minutes. But I took um, that image, zoomed in on this horse, started working out the drawing. You can see the different colors of, of pastel pencils, so it took me a while to, to get things just right. And again, I, my two ideas on this is I want to keep it loose, spontaneous, and I want to see light, uh, line work. I want to see lines. So what I did here was I took pastel for this underpainting and I put, worked it into the shapes. I vaguely thought about where light was coming from. So I wanted to put uh, some lighter uh, value of the green on the areas where I thought the light would be shining and make it darker in the other, so uh, in the other areas. So you can see that when I went to dissolve it, some drips start happening. And then I love this fuchsia hot pink thing. Mm -hmm. So I put this all across the bottom. I went back in after this was all dissolved and I redid my lines with charcoal, I believe. So I reestablished some lines there because I want to keep that. And then I just started playing with the pastel on top of it. I just started applying the pastel. This was a sheet of UART, so there's a grit on here. Uh, it's, it's made for pastel, and uh, it's a 12 by 18 size. And then I just started doing some mark, mark making. Again, I was thinking about a workshop that I took, and what was so cool about that workshop is that you could just, oh man, she put on the coolest music, and everybody would just be loose, and I thought, oh, this would be really fun. And during this time when we're um, more isolated, it seems like you need more, um, you want to take more chances and, and just, uh, you know, stimulation to just do something different outside the box. I kind of like this box, though. I kind of like working, working this way. It was a lot of fun. So... Yes. Judy, what made you pick those colors? Because obviously horses are not blue or green or purple. Tell us I, why you chose those colors, um, which I love. Oh, thank you. I um, and this is actually darker than the, than the, the painting we're going to look at in a minute. The actual painting. Well, I have some favorite colors in there, and I like. I keep saying I love hot pink. I love uh, lavender and mauves and. Um, purples and, and then these greens just seem really fun working with that and I wanted to uh, go for some drama I think too it's mm -hmm. just you know uh, it's just fun you know it, I, I just like the combinations and what's happening and I like the sense that I get looking at this of the movement of the animal and uh, so yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's the actual painting over here. Um, I think I'm going to call it done. And I, I love that there's some lines still showing through and uh, just got light application of some of these colors in the background here. But the paper showing through and I like that.
So the next thing was I decided um, I like this. This was super fun and a challenge I'm giving myself um, to explore and really work at is to work in a higher key. And if we look back at that value scale, that would mean colors that are in this realm of the value scale that are, that are lighter, that are lighter. So I thought, I want to work bigger, I want to have line, and I want to try and stay in a higher key. So I got out a piece of watercolor paper, and I haven't worked on watercolor paper in a long time. Uh, last week we saw Barb, and she works on a lot of watercolor paper. Uh, her beautiful pieces are on the same paper. Um, but working in pastel, it, the good thing about it is it has a grit. And uh, that gives the pastel something to hang on to. It also gives us a texture when we go to glaze on top of it. But since I'm working, my goal is on this painting, and this is the start of it, I'll keep you posted on Facebook on the progress. My goal is to work in this higher key, to keep line work, um, and that's basically it. But that's a big challenge for me because my tendency, if you look at my work, it's kind of a lot of intense colors. That one's not done yet, but if you look at, at, at my work overall, um, and we'll show you a few pieces, I tend to work with kind of, um, you know, intense colors. So it's a challenge for me. On this one, oh, one other thing I want to start doing is incorporating gold in my paintings. I don't know how that's going to look or how I'm going to achieve that. I bought some gold leaf, I have some gold pens, and I put some gold, I used two things on here. I used some gold oil that a friend gave me, a tube of, of, of um, you know, metallic gold, a, a light gold, and I also used um, an acrylic gold. I don't know, I just put them on there. I just thought, well, what the heck. This underpainting here is the high flow acrylic, uh, probably um, sienna color. So when I did my drawing, I first did my drawing in pencil. Then I started putting the paint on there and I noticed my pencil smudging. So I stopped what I was doing and got out some fixative, which is spray, spray it on there so the pencil marks wouldn't move. Then I put my underpainting on and then I said, I want these lines to show through. So I went in with um, a um, charcoal and I reestablished these these lines, and I, 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 I'm not trying to clearly photo reproduce anything, uh, trying to get some proportions right, but I'm not trying to be exact. But I put the charcoal down, and we know that's gonna smudge. So I went and put more fixative on it, and now I'm ready, I just put on some, so where I, I picture my darkest darks being, right in here, this area will probably be my lightest light, but the challenge now for me is going to be working in this range. So, you know, you can hold this up to what you're doing and see if the color you put down disappears. Um, I'm going to back up to when I showed you my underpaintings and how some of the colors just disappeared on the background. It's a different color, but if you squint, you can't see a difference, like an edge between this and this, or you know when it's the right value. So I'm gonna try to work, you know, my box is, is organized by value. This is kind of a messed up box right now, but on my little plein air one, you could see a gradation of the color from dark to light. So when my stuff is organized accordingly, approaching this painting, if I want to work in a high key, I'm going to have to make my selection of my pastels from this side of the box going across. So will you start with darks? Yes. Thank you for asking. Work from dark to light. And so, your, so the darkest color that you will use 
is not that black. Exactly. It will be one of these pinks or like a middle tone pink. Yes. That will be your darkest color. That will be my darkest color overall. But I, what I'm going to do is probably in a few areas maybe have a, a, a dark that's going to range outside of this range. But not very much of it. It'll be, what do you call that? Perhaps the highlight is a uh, low light. Well, I forgot what the word is. Shade. Right now. No, it's not. A, it's um, like a. Uh, oh, anyway, sorry, I can't think of that word. But but it'll just be a thing that sort of goes in and and, and uh, it's the opposite of a highlight, but it's used sparingly. So when I work, the lights will show up. They have to work off of something. Everything works in relation to the thing before it. So no matter what, when you're starting a painting, like some people go, oh, is it so hard to start a painting? And yes, it is. It's very hard to start a painting. And for me, just start drawing. And, and, then, and then you sort of start shifting your brain into that zone of creating. Uh, but you have to start with something. And, and so many teachers will say, just put something down. And I like it froze and they go, oh, I can't do this. Just put something down. Then you have something to respond to. So in the beginning, the start of that painting is I'm giving myself something to work on top of. So I had a lot of, a lot of um, space to go in, in trying to achieve working in a high key. So, um, Do you think you'll use some of the iridescent colors that you talked about even on top of the gold or? I think that would be really fun. Uh, particularly, I think on the blaze, on the horse's face, it'd be kind of fun to have, you know, if I chose that as the spot where um, maybe we want this to sparkle. Ooh. That could be really fun to just, you know, it has to be under a light for you to get that. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, if it doesn't do it enough with pastel, I could always say, no, oh, maybe I'll try it with a, an acrylic paint or an oil paint. See here, you can see a little glimmering there that is uh, some uh, oil. All right, so the next thing I want to show you is a painting. Uh, I started with my little thumbnails in my uh, uh, sketchbook. And uh, I had a photo reference. This is from a, a trout stream up in Wisconsin, a favorite. Uh, I actually stood in the stream and took the picture of the water tumbling over these rocks. Uh, so here I am. I started out with these from my thumbnail and my photo reference. I decided these were going to be the dark um, value shapes and the rocks. So I put Instead of using a complementary color scheme, which is the opposites on a color wheel, I decided to use the local color in a darker value. So this is a, past, a hard pastel used on its side on sanded pastel paper, UR paper. And then I went in and I dissolved it with odorless mineral spirit. All right, I don't have a progress shot there, but this progress shot shows me starting to apply the pastel over it. So here, I did go lighter than what I established my value to be. So I had to go back in and, and correct that. But I knew there was levels and layers of bushes here. So staying, trying to stay within that value, you can use different warm and cool color and there is degrees in there. Um, so here's another progress shot on my little plein air setup. Uh, because I'm not in my own studio at this moment, I am working on a little uh, condensed uh, setup that goes between you know, a little table easel and uh, my plein air boxes. And here is the painting as it is right now. So. Um, I decided to keep this a little bit lighter because there are two levels of, of bushes and things here. I wanted the main thing to be happening right in here. Uh, there is a hillside in the background 
Uh, so to push that back, I use blues and, and purples back here just to push this foliage back. And then, uh, anyway, kind of keep this. Wanted to frame this action here. So then I went in with the uh, edge of my soft pastels and made some little marks to indicate you know, more detail. And you leave this stuff till the very end. How do you know, Judy, when your painting is finished? Well, when I look at it and I, I feel that I stuck to my, well, I hate to say I stuck to my plan, but what I mean to say is that what I decide is the main interest and focal point in the painting, when, when I feel I've done a good job of making that the star of the painting and that, you know, everything that relates to it um, still has interest and such, but, uh, you know, my eye wants to move around because I've got some of these little marks and lighter areas, but I, I want people to stay here. When I feel like I've accomplished that with my painting, then I think, I can decide it's done. Do you sign it yet, though? I need to sign it. And then do you spray it? No, I do not use a spray fixative on top of it. Um, I know artists who will use a spray fixative during the process just to keep the pastel in place, uh, because sometimes you know if you build it up, build it up, um, pastel can come off. If you want to make sure that it stays put, sometimes you can spray but it has a tendency to darken the color so this one i think all i need to do is sign and i'm going to call that one done but i had the pleasure of being there i use all my own photo references uh, i remember the day and being in the stream and um, uh, fishing with the family and uh uh, anyway, it, it just brings a lot of joy. I can almost hear the sound of that stream. Oh, thank you. Thank you for saying that. It's, uh, it's a beautiful thing. That's why it's so awesome to paint um, on plein air or start paintings for me. Uh, some artists work mostly on plein air, but I feel like I, my goal is to get a good start, but take all of that experience back in with me into the studio. And, um, and then hopefully that translates. Uh, I have one more painting I wanna show you and um, we'll go through quickly the uh, steps for that. Um, so the last painting I wanna show you was a painting I started uh, on plein air on the Fox River uh, about three weeks ago. Finally had a nice day. So, I took my gear over there and set up and in the great outdoors, no one was close by. And um, I chose to paint under this tree, which this was not ideal, having a shadow right across my, um, my board, but uh, I moved um, after that. But I wanted to get my drawing done. So I took out my viewfinder here. Uh, I took photos. I had my plein air setup that I showed you earlier. And here it is. I wanted this lighthouse. I have visited here before, probably um, three years ago with some friends, and we, we painted here. And I'll show you that painting that was done on site. Uh, it's not a completed painting, but that one was done in the summer. And this one is in the spring. So not everything is leafed out here. Um, this was done in the morning. Uh, my other painting was done in the afternoon, so the lighting is different in those two different uh, times of the day. So I'll show you the other painting, which was done 100% uh, on site, and uh, you'll see the difference. But anyway, I draw, I drew it in here um, with my hot paint or fuchsia pastel pencil, and then I went in with watercolor. Um, oh wait, I take that back. This looks like my um, hand with the gouache that I showed you earlier. And I set this up on top of my pastel box 
and I had a little thing of water, and I just started brushing in the fuchsia, uh, trying to keep the darker, the darkest part here on that little pine tree, um, and get that set up. So I want you to see, here's what I'm going for. What I mentioned before was, I like the fact that it was windy, because in this, in this, I hope you can get this kind of, you can see what the wind is doing to the surface of the water. This is a moving, obviously moving water, and it's uh, windy, so there are these patterns that I noticed, where this swirled around, and then it was kind of flat right here. So this is a lighter blue that's in here. And then I liked this reflection of the lighthouse going down to the bottom of the, the painting. And this light right here. And then I wanted to extend that light just a little um, thinner bit across here. So I improvise. I don't always paint exactly what I see. I move things around. I do the same thing in nature. Uh, I edit in nature like I would edit in my photo references. I decide what is going to work for me and what excites me about what I'm seeing or what interests me. So there's a pretty loose um, roadmap for me to follow. Like I said, I always get to try and keep in my mind, and when I translate it into the painting, what it is that was interesting to me about the scene. Um, I, I hope that when I create my paintings, that it's obvious what I was going for and what I what excited me about the scene. So here I've worked a little further along. You can see on my little camp stool, I've got this extra box of pastels. Uh, there's more in there. Here's my pastel box. I had a bungee cord the backpack to the uh, tripod because it was super windy. Um, again, you can see a little bit. This kept happening um, with that um, pattern of the darker water and then where it's lighter, where the wind was blowing across. And then here's the, the painting where I'm at so far. So it's a 9 by 12. Uh, it's that spring morning light. Um, this was a lot of brown back in here, but it's springtime, so I wanted to sort of, A, I wanted to use a lighter, cooler value of color in the background to push uh, this foliage back. And I did put foliage on some of these trees, but tried to indicate that it's springtime. The overall color just seems like a cooler color to me uh, of the light, uh, the morning light here at this location. But I did indicate these shapes that I liked of what was happening with the water. So I have to finish uh, a little bit of some indication of some reflections here that I saw, and also, you know, work, work through these shapes a little bit more. But um, that's where I'm at on this one. Uh, what I want to do is show you the one I did a few years earlier, and it was in the afternoon, um, same scene. All right, so this is the painting that I did a few years ago. Uh, it was in the afternoon, or, or right around noon, uh, summer. So this is all filled in, same lighthouse, someone was kayaking. This is not a finished painting, this is a reference, this was done on site. And um, so, you know, it is what it is, but I just thought it was interesting. To, I came across this when I was going through some, some paintings I had in storage. And I thought, oh, it's the same subject, but what a different look. You know, two different um, interpretations of the same scene. So I've started this one on site, gathered information, and I've done a ton of work um, in my little studio setup working on this. So this has a different feel than this being on site, taking colors and putting it on there and 
putting on there heavily and um, just trying to work fast. And, and this is what I loved. I, I love this shape cutting across here. And all this dark in the background for this to bounce off of. And then this just has a, a, it's a windy day. It was a cold, windy spring day. So, I don't know, two different feelings. Well, I'd like to uh, share uh, with you three paintings that were easily accessible from my storage facility right now. And these will give you an idea of what I'm talking about with light and what um, intrigues me about light and what's, what, uh, why I like it so much. Um, I wasn't able to find any of the more sublime uh, light effects that I also enjoy painting. I wasn't able to locate those paintings, but the foggy, misty day and what that does to uh, the different subjects. Again, that would force me to work in a higher key. Uh, but anyway, I couldn't locate any of those paintings. But I wanted to just share these with you. So um, here's a, a fishing scene. This is um, actually my son. And um, right away, uh, you know, love this whole thing going on here. Um, and the dark, rich colors that all of that can bounce off of. Uh, Barrington has a lot of amazing barns. And this is a barn I would drive by, gosh, several times a week. and. Uh, I don't know why, but I, I love the barn, love the barn, love the farm, but I, this is the first time I noticed the shadows of the trees on the barn this one day. So I'm driving along and I was like, whoa, I, I went down the road, turned around, came back, and I was like, oh man, I gotta somehow snap some pictures of this and uh, use this in a painting. It was just so stunning to me. And uh, it's a beautiful farm, and I, I just love the shadow shapes that were falling on the on the barn, across the barn. Beautiful white barn. Um, this one down here, this was super fun. Uh, a, f a friend um, out in Sonoma is in this uh, uh, Patak club, and uh, a friend and I went and were watching, and uh, they invited me to try my hand at it, and I was horrid. But uh, I started taking some pictures of these guys because uh, I liked the way the guys in the shadows, uh, just, you know, a little sunlight peeking through and landing on their shoulders. And uh, this guy just blended in with the background because of the dark clothes he was wearing. And this guy, in a way, too, uh, here kind of goes in and, and uh, Ed, in his white t-shirt. He was right there overseeing uh, this fellow throwing uh, the ball. So anyway, I also loved this shadow shape and loved what was happening on his shirt. shirt. So that was a really fun, fun painting to do as well. And those are the kind of things that my eye is just looking for. Um, in everyday situations, um, doesn't matter if you're uh, social distancing and you're out on the trail hiking or whatever, you can always find uh, things like this if you uh, really are attentive to what's going on around you. And that's one of the beautiful things about becoming more and more, or getting more and more involved in painting is it's just like, I feel like my eye is getting tuned um, and I, I notice a lot more. So again, I want to thank the White House for inviting me to be a part of um, this virtual arts and culture series. Um, normally, uh, we have a third Thursday artist night out uh, once a month at the White House. We've had amazing uh, turnouts and uh, a lot of fabulous artists, all fabulous artists that have had shows there. And it's just becoming more and more popular, and we miss that we're, able, we're, not, we're unable to do it. So I'm delighted that the White House has decided to continue with providing uh, art and culture uh, content to everybody. Um, it just so happened that I was um, reading a blog that I follow, or, and um, they referenced in this particular artist um, 
a review that was published by the American Journal of Public Health, and it was titled, it was titled The Connection Between Art, Healing, and Public Health, a Review of Current Literature. This review goes back to 2010. Um, I, I follow a, a guy named James Clear, who um, is the author of the book Atomic Habits. I guess I'm giving him a little plug, but it's a great book. It's a great blog. And um, he mentioned this article uh, in his blog. And I just thought it was striking that, you know, obviously very intentional on his part, um, mentioning the World Health Organization, which we hear a lot about now, and also public health. And, and a little excerpt from this article that I was reading um, says, quote, there is evidence that engagement with artistic activities, whether as an observer of the creative efforts of others or as an initiator of one own's, crea one's own creative efforts, can enhance one's moods, emotions, and other psychological states, as well as have a salient impact on important physiological parameters. And I just thought that was so poignant that um, in this time when we have to stay in our, in our homes or, or distant, socially distant from people, um, different organizations and artists are finding ways to continue to share art with the public. And it's been very helpful, um, I think, for everyone to stay connected to the arts. Um, what they were talking about in this was music, visual arts, muse, movement based creative expression, and expressive writing. Those were the four avenues that were explored in that review. Uh, but I encourage you to continue to follow uh, the offerings that the Barrington's White House is um, presenting, and also take time now to check out museums. Um, uh, different art museums that maybe you wouldn't have the chance to visit. Uh, all of them are offering so much more content in terms of uh, discussions about um, galleries, specific works of art, uh, and just take this time to become involved and check out musical offerings. Uh, the White House is providing that as well. And um, thank you again so much. Um, for having me and taking the time to spend this evening with me. And thank you to Barb Ross and uh, Connor Levitt for his uh, filming. And um, hope to see you next week with another offering. Hi again, Judy. Thank you so much for coming in and answering questions and agreeing to be part of our artist series. Thank you, Connor. I appreciate the opportunity. Of course. So we'll, uh, we've got some questions here. We'll get right into it already. Um, first question I think we'll go with here is um, talking about what projects you are currently working on and also how many projects do you kind of work on at once? That is a good question. Um, pretty much what I showed um, in this um, uh, episode uh, is what I'm currently working on <clears throat> because uh, my studio basically is in storage right now. So um, these things um, are, are what I'm working on um, at the moment. Um, I do like to have several things going at the same time though. Um, I, I get a good start on something and then I find I need a little break and take some space so I can uh, reanalyze what I'm doing and then I'll inevitably uh, start up a new thing or uh, get an underpainting done on something. So, um, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, <clears throat> questions about uh, maybe how long it takes you to take something from start to finish, or maybe you can point out a specific painting since I know uh, some of them are, you know, very different in style. Yeah. Um, That is such a hard thing to answer. Um, I know there's artists that can complete a painting in three hours, you know, and um, a lot of times they're the plein air artists that are used to working under the time constraints and light lighting constraints of working outdoors. Um, 
but I'd start and stop a painting um, a lot. And then uh, also, you know, get other paintings going. I've never kept track of how many hours I put in a painting, but I think that'd be a really interesting um, thing to do. So I, I wish I had a better answer to that question, but um, I really don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it varies. And as we learned with uh, Barb last week, it, uh, it's never done until it catches your eye just right and, and feels yeah. that done. And there are times, uh, it's very cool when it happens and it doesn't happen a lot, but some paintings just seem to uh, unfold uh, under your hand. And I, I've had a couple that um, they just came about so much more quickly and easily. I, I don't know what that is. Um, uh, I know other artists will experience the same thing. It's not on every painting, but sometimes they just really come together and, and you can get them done more quickly. Awesome. So you did talk about your inspirations um, early on, talking about outdoor scenes and uh, being a, a fly fisher women and horses and cowboys. Um, do you uh, do um, group scenes like the horses often uh, running in for the pasture or are you uh, more interested in landscapes? Is there one in particular or is it kind of both? It's really, it's really both. And as you saw at the end of the, of the, uh, the program, then there was one with these figures. Um, uh, well, as in the fly fishermen too, uh, it's what's happening with the light on the shapes, you know, on, on the person's body, what the gesture is, what they're doing. And typically, um, yeah, it, I would say the universal thing is what's, uh, what catches my eye, uh, with the light. Uh, for example, I've got a painting um, hanging over at Ambrosia right now, and it's a small uh, painting of a scene, uh, a photo I took when I was on a trip to France. And it's a, a mom looking in a bakery window with a little stroller in front of her with uh, one or two kids in the stroller. And there was beautiful shadow shape from the awning coming uh, down over the window on the bakery. And it's a small painting, but when I saw that mother standing in front of the window looking at the offerings for the day and that shadow shape and the colors, um, that got my attention and I, and, and I painted that. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I enjoy landscapes, I enjoy people, I enjoy animals, and I think the constant is something about the light on those subjects that catches my eye. In that same vein, uh, do you capture indoor scenes or are you uh, truly the plein air and being outdoors? No, I um, actually enjoy what happens when uh, the light's coming through a window and casting interesting shadows. I. Um, uh, in our house, we had a big bay window in our living room, and at the end of the day, it was a western exposure. The light would come through the window and cast a grid shadow from the bay window on the wall behind the couch. And one day, it occurred to me that there's this grid shadow on the wall, then there's the divided light window, um, and there was also a shadow of a lamp that was on the bay window and then there was the real lamp so I was just like holy cow I've lived here for so long and I've never seen this and all of a sudden I saw it took a picture and I I did an oil painting of it it was just like um so the answer is yes that was a long answer uh, and I've got another one uh where shadows are coming in across the floor uh in my house and um I liked the shapes uh of the light coming in and the dark shapes and so uh, that one has yet to be painted, but uh, yeah, I do like interior scenes if they have some uh, unique lighting scenarios. Awesome. 
Uh, you did call out the uh, fly fisherman painting. We do have a question here about who the subject of that fly for fisherman painting is. Who is that? Oh, that's uh, my son. So I painted my son and my husband. <laughs> fly fishing. And so they're my, they paint, they're my subject. Do, do they paint you in return or are you the artist? <laughs> um, I don't know. I shouldn't. No. No, they haven't done that. We need a female fly fisher. So uh, my daughter-in-law and my daughter need to uh, get in the stream and, and I need to get some, some um, good photo references of them and uh, equal opportunity. A uh, specific question about uh, the UR paper you mentioned uh -huh. and why do you like it? Well, I, as I mentioned, they have several different grits. Um, they have the paper also uh, mounted on a, um, uh, seems like a um, map board, uh, archival acid-free um, uh, map board. I, I just like the grit and um, the consistency of it. I, I do use other papers as well. A favorite was this uh, paper called Wallace and then um, uh, they stopped making it and that's no longer available to purchase, but I have some sheets um, still in my supply, but uh, that was the best uh, in my opinion, uh, or my preference, I should say. Uh, but I also work on pastel boards and like I said, I make my own surfaces, but UART is really good and you can try, it'd be fun to get a sample pack and just try the different grits. I would recommend that. And you can buy that for the artists. You can buy that through uh, Dakota Art Supplies. They're in Washington State, but um, they sell you art there. Yeah, that was a, another question here too, was about uh, if you had any recommendations on what kind of a grit to start at for painters, but it sounds like if they uh, get a, a variety pack and kind of go that way. Yeah, that would be that would be a good way to try, and then you could really compare and see what your preference is. Yeah. Question here. Oh, I I would also um, suggest that if um, artists can locate, uh, you know, different colored surfaces, um, try that as well. You may really enjoy working on a colored surface, so there's options for that as well. This question says. Judy, I have seen and heard you describe a scene and get emotional. You try to <laughs> portray that emotion, and how do you do that? Uh, I don't think I intentionally try to relay that. I just feel like, um, yes, I do get emotional, for sure. Um, but I think... Um, if you're if you're passionate about something or you love something uh your effort and your um i don't know it, it somehow maybe i hope comes through if, if you're a person who loves color and and you're doing what you love it, it eventually comes out in your work somehow it's either the way you I don't know, there just seems to be, it's not mechanical, um, it's, um, I don't know, that's, that's, a, that's a difficult, difficult question to answer. Um, but I hope that people will get a sense seeing my work that they know I love what I'm doing. Um, and that would be really important. Yeah, definitely. Um, question about, uh, you talked about kind of oftentimes maybe uh, not knowing where to start or having a hard time starting, but this question is specifically about what gives you the confidence to proceed with a drawing and take it forward to a finished piece? Well, sometimes I don't always have confidence uh, about it, but um, uh, nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? So. Um, I, I say to myself a lot, hey, no one's getting hurt here. So it's a piece of paper or it's a canvas, you know, I could throw it out. Um, or I've done this before, I've painted over it, or I've gone back into uh, pastel paintings and said, I don't like it, and take odorless mineral spirits and dissolve it all and, and work on top of it. And then, you know, you've got a little history 
underneath your next painting. And to me, I think that's really cool. I mean, nobody else knows what's under there, but uh, uh, at the Art Institute, they have a painting by uh, Picasso called the, um, uh, it's the guitarist and it's all in blue and uh, they did studies on it. And, and I don't know how they did it with technology and they saw different things that Picasso had done underneath that painting. Uh, that are lurking beneath the surface of the finished painting. So I don't know, I think it's kind of cool to try to just say, I'm gonna go for it. And if it doesn't work out, I'll start over or I'll do something on top of it. Or I think that's, maybe that's what gives me confidence then or, or lack of fear. I, I don't know, it's hard to start, but you have to kind of, you know, give yourself a little boost and um, reassure, I have to reassure myself that, yeah. No one's getting hurt here. I get to do this. Very cool. Uh, I think we'll do a couple more here. Um, this person claims to have known you, uh, and they're asking, when did you actually start painting seriously? Well, I um, always loved art. Uh, and then um, I would say uh, kind of took a, um, hiatus from doing art uh, for a number of years, but uh, I wanted to get back into it. Uh, when our daughter went to college, I thought I would um, maybe take a class at the Art Institute, and that wasn't feasible, but uh, there was the art school in town, a Kaleidoscope, and I thought, hey, I'm just gonna go uh, jump in a, a drawing class and just get my feet wet again and see what that's like. And literally, that was in 2005, and literally, uh, after the first class of sitting down and drawing a still life, I felt like I reconnected with a friend I hadn't seen in a long time. And we just picked up where we left off. And uh, it was a big deal. So I just kind of started with drawing. And then um, they had more offerings. And I thought, I'll try different things. And uh, it was at Kaleidoscope that I was introduced to uh, pastels. And uh, I just really liked it. I, I liked the feel of it. I, I did other things as well, but um, it seems that uh, I keep gravitating back towards um, pastel. So 2005. <laughs> and then I th uh, last question here, I'll combine a couple. Or people are asking, uh, how do they get a hold of you to do a commission painting if you do that? And then do you sell sketches? I think you be a good time to plug your website or uh, best way to reach you. Yeah, so I have a website. Um, it's called judysculberstad.com. Pretty good. Um, and you can contact me at uh, through my email. Um, I'm also on Facebook and Instagram, uh, but I have an email address, um, uh, judysculberstadfineart at gmail.com. And um, yes, I do commissions. Um, I'm honored uh, to um, do commissions. I would be delighted. Um, and um, did I answer every, every part of that question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you wanna, uh, before we sign off here, do you wanna give a little plug? We were talking about uh, different, you talked about at the end of the video here too, about different museums and the opportunities those are affording uh, while we're all uh, kind of stuck at home? Yeah, yeah. I just see uh, more and more that um, uh, different art museums around the country have more uh, content for people because their uh, museums are closed. And for example, at the Art Institute of Chicago, um, if you go to their website, they'll have some links to some YouTube, um, little quick uh, videos. Uh, they'll, they'll take a painting uh, perhaps and get the curator and discuss the painting and highlight things about the painting on the painting in the discussion. And it's, you know, two, three minutes long, maybe five minutes. Um, all the museums are different, but, you know, take a little break and um, check out some art online. It's a great opportunity to see some things um, that maybe normally they wouldn't have available since they're closed. So um, again, thank you all for, joining me this evening. Um, if you have any questions, please contact me. And um, um, thank you to the White House again for inviting me to be a part of this series.
Thank you.